I don't think anybody will ever live up there again. It's kind of been barricaded off. Stay away, keep out, don't come here. We've had abductions, carjackings, kidnappings, but not an entire family taken in a night. You didn't know whether to be crying and bawling or just shut up and listen and wait. I'm happy to die. I'm Vaughn, November 2003. A traditional farming community 40 miles north of Jackson, Mississippi. Vaughn is a small community on, in the western side of Yazoo County in central Mississippi. It's an extremely rural area. Vaughn is just a quiet little country community. Everybody knows everybody. Everybody looks out for everybody. You know, people say that blood is thicker than water, and that certainly applies around here. Family is very important. The Hargans, an established cattle farming family, have owned land all over Yazoo County for as long as people can remember. I'm not sure how many generations back they go, but all the property, you know, that they lived on, and there was hundreds of acres, you know, it was all Hargan family property. Michael, Rebecca, and James Patrick are the latest generation of Hargans, captured on a family portrait. 26-year-old construction worker Michael lives close to his mom, Diane, in Vaughn. Well, everybody loves Michael, Rebecca, and James Patrick. 28-year-old Rebecca works part-time in physical therapy and cares for the couple's three-year-old son, James Patrick. All of my family, my mother, my sisters, I mean, everybody loved him. The Hargan family was just your almost um, ideal idea of a typical American Southern family. Really, what, what you see is what you got with them. They were close-knit, loving, happy family. They loved each other and enjoyed each other and real love. This is a picture of Michael with his mother and sister and Rebecca prior to them getting married. The Hargan family were the kind of people that, they were just a very welcoming, kind uh, pe people that if, if, if you just showed up and, and needed some help, they, they would have brought you right in. Then we have Michael and Rebecca. They're still in high school. They're very smitten with each other. It's very cute to see them together because they just love to hug each other. Then we have the wedding up in Missouri. Michael being the country boy that he was, of course, at the reception, he had to put on his cowboy hat to let everybody know, you know, he's a country boy and he's here. That everybody's all smiles because Rebecca's now a Hargan. Christmas 2003. Michael, Rebecca, and James Patrick gather with their extended family to celebrate. We were all there, sitting on each other's laps and just having a great time. Rebecca just stepped right in like she'd been one of us for years. Very considerate, you know, of our family traditions. Behind the smiles, Michael's mom, Diane, has been diagnosed with cancer. I did feel like the whole family came together to support, you know, of course, Diane. Whatever they needed at any time, we were there. Valentine's Day, 2004. 
In this small community, a neighbor spots something's not right at Michael and Rebecca's home. Someone drove by the house and noticed that Michael's truck door was open. The house door is kind of cracked open. Somebody needs to go check that out. Michael's aunt went up to the house to make sure that everything was OK. Family and friends had phoned the Hargans the night before. They were expected to be home that Saturday morning. Inside, there's damage that looks like it may have been caused by gunshots, and blood spatter is visible both inside and outside the house. They knew something was wrong and called the sheriff. The family's sudden disappearance simply makes no sense. I knew, knowing Michael for as long as I had, that that was totally out of character for him. His mother had cancer at the time and was, was going through a very difficult time. There's absolutely no way that he would have abandoned her without any type of notice. Forensic investigators scour the scene. They soon notice sinister evidence inside Michael's vehicle. When I first got here, the head of the crime scene unit, he showed me the projectiles laying on the ground. He showed me blood in the truck, on the truck. There was blood splatter up under the vehicle as though somebody was either beaten on the ground or maybe even shot while laying on the ground. There was things that were disturbed in the residence, some items that were strewn around that were out of place. In the house were several 22 caliber casings found on the floor. They were collected for evidence. None of the Hargan's own guns have been fired, and no other weapons were left behind. But there are some clues. The head of the crime scene unit, he said, I've got one more thing to show you. He had a baseball cap. I held it close to my face, and it was an odor that just overwhelmed. None of us could, could figure out the odor. James Patrick was a asthmatic child, and the first thing that was noted was his nebulizer and medicine was still in the vehicle. Everyone kept telling us if you don't find them quick, the baby will die. One of the most unusual cases I've ever seen in my life. There's a real, real good chance that one person didn't survive in this family. Once word gets out that Michael, Rebecca, and James Patrick Hargan are missing, the extended family gathers in support. There were all kind of law enforcement agencies trying to figure out what was going on. Michael and Rebecca were at home on Friday night and were planning to go to the rodeo that Saturday evening. Everybody was just in shock. Nobody, nobody knew what to think or what to do. They were the typical working class, rural Mississippi family that just worked, went home, and, and minded their business. You had a lot of people that wanted to help that knew the Hargan family, but had very little, if any, information of what could have happened. Here's a lovely little family that's just gone. Who would want to harm them? We've had abductions and we've had carjackings and kidnappings and so forth. 
but not necessarily an entire family taken and removed without very little evidence to know the reason. With no evidence of forced entry, investigators speculate that the family may have known whoever took them. We were literally digesting Michael Hargon's family life. And that goes from anything who may have been a sitter or somebody that took care of James Patrick to anyone that may have worked with his wife. Was there any domestic situation between Michael and his wife? Digging into the family's past soon reveals a lead that will raise even more troubling questions. We found out after we got to talking to relatives, this house had been the scene of a, of a tragic crime 10 years before. And that just really struck me as, as unusual. Something involved with that crime could have very well had an impact on the disappearance of the Morgan family. All families have secrets, but not secrets like this. In rural Mississippi, Michael, Rebecca, and James Patrick Hargan have been missing for 24 hours. Investigators have just discovered that Michael's family were victims of violent crime before, 10 years ago. We found out after we got to talking to relatives Michael's father had been killed in an armed robbery. It just reeked of almost something involved with that crime could have very well had something to do with Michael and his disappearance. There's not a lot of coincidences in criminal investigations. It's usually evidence and facts. Two very major violent crimes in a very extremely rural area in the exact same location to the same family is just, you know, off the charts as far as not being coincidental. This is the article from the Yazoo Herald that was published on Wednesday, April 27th, 1994. The Linwood community was rocked by last Friday's robbery and murder of a convenience store owner. Dan Haywood Hargan, 42, owner of Fowler Road Grocery, was shot numerous times at approximately 10.40 a.m. The single-story brick building lived in by Michael and his family was the exact same location where his dad was murdered. Haywood ran a store which was remodeled by Michael into his house. Haywood had a couple of fellas come in one day around lunchtime, hold him up and shoot him. Killed him dead in the store. The loss of his father devastates then 16-year-old Michael. Michael had a very hard time dealing with that, but he did deal with it very well, you know, and stepped up into Haywood's place as far as taking care of things that Haywood took care of for the family. The three men who committed the robbery were caught and convicted. Now, you need to know everything that you can find out about that original crime, and you have to put to, to bed anything that had anything to do with those people that were involved in that crime or who they may have been contacted with. Three days before the Hargan family disappeared, one of the armed robbers comes up for parole. Michael had recently been involved in a probation parole hearing involving the people that had killed his father. The Hargans testify at the hearing, arguing that he should not be released. And that parole, that had been denied. And initially, many of us believed that the disappearance of the Hargan family was related to some sort of retaliation for what had happened with the parole here. The family has now been missing for over 30 hours. 
police launch an extensive search in the area surrounding the Hargan home. There were people trolling on their property. People were out, you know, in the pastures trying to find them. Hope was very important. We, I, I, you know, we prayed about it all the time. You just, you just had to hope for a miracle. You can look at this area. Uh, we probably hadn't passed four houses in seven miles. Tremendous amount of rural area that's within just a few miles of Michael Hargan's house. It was just a tremendous undertaking just to cover most of the roads to try to find any item that may connect to the Hargan's. We searched and we searched, but we didn't find anything. Nothing was turning up. It was, uh, it was gut-wrenching. And that family was already jinxed in a way. Uh, it's, you can't describe it, it's just sad. Police interview all Hargan family members, hoping for any leads. They reveal Michael had recently come into an inheritance from his late uncle Charles. Could Michael's recent good fortune be a motive for murder? In this particular area, it is probably some of the most expensive land in the state. There's been a lot of cases that had to do with murder and heirs to an estate. Investigators call in Ernest Lee Hargan along with his wife, Lisa, a local veterinarian. Ernest is Michael's cousin and not long ago had been cut out of Charles's will in favor of Michael. Ernest Lee Hargan was a hard ass, but he was a cowboy, he hauled cattle, worked cattle, loving, having a good time. If we can help at all, uh, uh, we want to help. The belief was by the people who in the community that knew the Hargans best that Ernest Lee Hargan, the adopted child of Charles Hargan, would have been the one to inherit the estate of Charles Hargan but the will had been changed very shortly before Charles died, and he had made Michael Hargan to inherit. Uncle Charles's will said that Michael would get everything, but he cut Ernest Lee out. Michael made several attempts to get Ernest Lee to come over, and he was just being bullheaded. If Ernest Lee would have just come and saw his daddy before he died, he wouldn't have been cut out but Ernest Lee just held a grudge against his daddy over nothing like a lot of families have. We like Michael and his family back home, but like everyone, right? They had an alibi uh, that they gave that they were both at home with each other on the night, on the disappearance. Uh, I believe uh, Friday, Friday and Saturday, Lisa and I had been taken ill. Uh, well, I mean, we couldn't even face breakfast. Uh, investigators felt like they hadn't shown any deception or signs of anybody that would have been nervous or concerned that would have been involved in a crime like that. For law enforcement, Michael's inheritance remains a red flag. That kind of put a different light on Ernest Lee. That really became a possible motive changing from a son getting the inheritance to a nephew caused us a lot of concern. Two days after the Hargans disappeared, investigators request that Ernest Lee submit to a lie detector test. Ernest Lee consented and took a polygraph. It was imperative that we develop some information. This was a very high pressure situation for, for law enforcement. This case was the only case I've ever had where an entire family was missing. Were you involved in the commission of this crime?
February 2004. In Mississippi, the Hargan family has been missing for two days. Police are currently focused on Michael's cousin, Ernest Lee Hargan. Ernest Lee Hargan easily agreed to take the polygraph. Ernest Lee has become a person of interest after investigators learned he was recently written out of his adopted father Charles's will. Do you know anybody who was involved in the commission of this crime? No. The polygraph came back uh, inconclusive, leaning toward him telling the truth. He was calm, collective. He didn't, didn't have any concern whatsoever. That's pretty painless. Thank you, gentlemen. We had to put more interest on other leads that could be valuable, uh, because it appeared that he was totally removed from anything to do with Michael Harkin. Investigators still have no murder weapon, fingerprints, or DNA results. They still have no match to the shell casings found at the crime scene. And another important lead draws a blank. All contact information was analyzed regarding the people that had killed him, Michael's father, and who they had contact with, who had met with them, who had talked to them. And there was no indication of their awareness of the hearing or who had testified at the hearing. So we were able to rule that out. We would work on a lead. We would come to a point where the lead would cool off and, and it didn't appear that there was anything there. I, I sat for hours and tried to figure out the next move to make. It seems like the same stuff was going on. You know, more questions. Where are they? Where could they be? What could have happened? Who could have done this to them? We were getting no answers anywhere. Nobody could tell us anything. This man worked a lot of overtime trying to provide for his family. This woman was dedicated to their child. It was overwhelming. This is from the February 25th, 2004 edition of the Azu Herald. The, the story, the headline very boldly, is still missing. And that said it all. That's, that's what was on everybody's mind in our community during that time. Where are they? What happened to them? Probably the most visible thing that was happening in the community that, at this time was the church community coming together and praying for the family, for, uh, for a good outcome to the case. We do believe in God. We did believe that God was gonna bring them home safe to us. We had a candlelight vigil one night. I wanted to stay busy, but my main thing was staying by my aunt's side. You didn't know whether to be crying and bawling or just shut up and listen and wait. Michael's mother, Diane, was emotional. She was trying to hold on to her faith and to her hope. She had the normal mama struggles. You know, where's, where's my baby? Where's my baby's baby? The community and local media do all they can to help find the Hargans. There's a photograph in this article of the flyers of the missing persons with the three members of the family. And it states that over 60,000 flyers containing this information are being distributed. And their faces were everywhere. If you picked up the daily paper, 
The Hargan family was on the front page. If you turned on the television news, the Hargan family was on the news. And that's a rare thing for yeah, anything from Yazoo County. Investigators set up a tip line, and it's inundated with information. One witness account seems especially promising. We had a credible lead that we thought was going to lead to, to the breaking of the case. There was one report that we received of a white van from an eyewitness. In the hours that fit of the family being either assaulted and overtaken. And it was the only vehicle that we had at the time that we had a lead on it. The story reads, the alleged van was seen sometime between daybreak and 8 a.m. where the Hargan residence is located. The van was also seen parked at the Hargan residence. The white panel works van was spotted just hours before Michael's aunt discovers the family is gone. You can stand out here for an hour at a time without a vehicle going by. There's not any traffic in here. Very few houses in this area. So anybody that would assign a vehicle in this area, especially in that morning time hours, it, it was possible that it could have, have had something of interest to do with this case. Investigators focus on developing the theory that someone could have used the van to abduct all three family members. It would be the type of vehicle that you would, you know, could use to uh, conceal or carry anything from the Hargan house. That was considered to be a promising lead. And any lead was hope. We were chasing white vans around Vaughn and Linwood for a couple of days, just hoping to find something. Very hopeful in a way, but very emotional. As long as there's no bodies, there's always a little hope that they're still alive. They're still alive and breathing. One white van became many white vans that could have possibly had to do with the abduction. Those all have to be put to rest and worked, and, and it takes a, a lot of manpower and a lot of hours to run those leads down. Eventually, an explanation arises for the white van seen outside the house. It was determined to be some workers that were in the area early that happened to be coming by during that time with the crime. And we still were not being able to produce uh, anything viable that would uh, solve this thing quickly. We were hitting a lot of dead ends, but that would change. We got a visit from someone who would turn the whole Hargun family case upside down. This case was completely different than what we had originally thought. February 2004. The Hargan family has disappeared under suspicious circumstances. After 13 days, the investigation is badly in need of a break when a witness walks in with a stunning revelation. We got a visit from a person of interest. We received contact from Ernest Lee Hargon's wife, Lisa, asking to talk to an investigator. She was upset, uh, concerned, scared. Ernest Lee Hargan is considered a potential suspect after he was written out of a will in favor of Michael. She started telling us about what she had seen and by where her husband had got up in the middle of the night on the 14th the day the Hargans come up missing and left. 
and then called her that morning and tell her, told her if anybody asked, they were together all night. Later on, they went out to eat uh, Valentine's Day supper. And by then, Lisa had found out, everybody had found out about Michael Hargan being missing, and that she began to question him about it. And he said he didn't want to talk about it. Finally, he said, yes, I went to Michael's and said it got out of hand. Fearful for her own safety, Lisa had not come forward earlier, but now her testimony breaks the whole case wide open. Everything was in toward Ernest Lee Hargan. Lisa contradicts Ernest Lee Hargan's alibi and reveals critical new details. Lisa gave particular direct information that he had been destroying things that were believed to be evidence at their house that they had not had stomach virus on the night of the abduction, that she was alone and home. We had to make sure that she was being truthful, but we also had to protect our interests that she was the best witness that we had that had direct knowledge that he had committed this crime. Investigators share an exclusive piece of evidence with Lisa, the foul-smelling cap found at the crime scene. The crime lab had figured out that the ball cap that was found in the scene at Michael Hargan's house, some of the hair on the cap was hair from a monkey, and that really had uh, shook us up. We'd come to find out that Lisa had a pet monkey. She knew that was a hat or similar hat to one that Ernest Lee owned. After Lisa's revelation, police rushed to Ernest Lee's home, 100 miles south from the crime scene in Vaughan. We moved very fast that afternoon to initiate the detention of Ernest Lee Hart, before Ernest Lee realized that she had cooperated with us. We were able to isolate, locate, and take him down. He gives up without a fight. He was just as calm, just like the first original interview. You know, what I would refer to as a flatliner. There's just nobody home. Ernest Lee was held until we initiated the search warrant of the uh, residence at their house. We found ammunition casings, fired casings that came out of his clothing in a washer that was collected. And there were also casings that were actually stuck on the windshield wipers of his pickup truck. Once they were able to tell us that those comparisons of those casings matched the casings found at the scene, we knew we were at the right place with the right person, with the right or a weapon that was used, this is the person that did this crime. Investigators search Ernest Lee and Lisa's property for the missing family, but there's no sign of the Hargans. I still had hopes for the baby and Rebecca. You know, surely nobody would kill the mama and the baby too. I guess maybe I did have a little hope, a little hope that Ernest Lee had not harmed them. Maybe they're hungry, maybe they're thirsty, but they're still alive and breathing. Three days after his arrest, Ernest Lee is taken to court for a preliminary hearing. Still without information on the whereabouts of the missing family, investigators need answers. You going to tell us where they are, Ernest Lee? Initial interviews of Ernest Lee was nothing. Stonewall, no information. I don't know what you're talking about, sir. No help whatsoever. 
uh, refused to give us any information as to the location of the, the three missing hard guns. They decide to try and trick Ernest Lee into talking by enlisting the help of his beloved wife, Lisa, who plays along with the ruse. We basically told Ernest Lee that she would be in charge and housed in a different location. She's going to be charged with three capital murders. You want that, Ernest Lee? More than two weeks since the Hargan family was abducted, police need suspect Ernest Lee Hargan to tell them where they can find the missing family. Where are you taking her? Lisa, his wife, agreed to participate with us in a ruse of Ernest Lee to elicit information. I, I don't want... She's going to be charged with three capital murders. You really want that, Ernest Lee? He immediately changed to, if she's being charged, you have to understand she didn't have anything to do with this. I'll show you where they are. And we immediately told him, you know, we need confirmation of what you did with us people, where did you put them, and we, you, you have to do it now. Lisa is never charged for initially withholding information, and now with her help, Ernest Lee tells all. I hear where they are. A gate, a wireframe gate, and like 10 laid out. It's been there a long time, I don't know for how long. They're right there. He's right there. The body. I mean, three. Michael, Rebecca, and Kyle. They were buried kind of with their arms around. It looked like a family sleeping together. Everybody that went to that scene had tears in their eyes. Ernest Lee Hargan committed the Valentine's Day murders after being written out of his father's will just a month before. I went to Mike's house to talk to him about the wheel. So he went to the truck and started turning around in the truck. After shooting Michael Hargan next to his pickup, Ernest Lee enters the family's home. I knew Rebecca was in there and child. Did you get her with a gun? I hit her with the hand with the gun in it. Where did you get her? I can't tell for sure if it was a head or upper shoulder, but I told her to get, get the child. He drug her and the child out of the bedroom, out of the bed, got into a confrontation in the hall, which is what caused his losing of his cap and either by striking her or trying to strike her, discharged around in the house. Ernest Lee takes Rebecca and James Patrick hostage and forces them into his car beside Michael's body. And then he leaves the residence drives close to 100 miles from Michael's house and kill the wife and the child at that location. She was standing with her back away from 
I came up behind her and wrapped it around her neck, probably twice, hold it tight. And then I just child the same way. But you can't get that child out of your mind. I felt pure anger and rage. Just pure rage. Plus sadness, too. Knowing that it definitely, Michael and them were definitely gone. But for the most part, pure rage. They had no enemies. They weren't mean to people. They weren't vicious people. That stuff just doesn't happen to nice people. I'm sorry. I can still just remember it felt like I had to swallow some poison or something. It was just, it was a lot of sorrow and bitterness and anger. 2005, a jury takes less than four hours to sentence Ernest Lee Hargan to death. Two years later, he was killed in prison after being stabbed by another inmate over 30 times. What happened to Michael and Rebecca and James Patrick is just something so terrible and so senseless that you're wasting your time trying to rationalize it or trying to get an answer of why. This man was welcomed into people's homes he was loved just like the rest of us. And for him to do something so heinous was just devastating. You know, how can someone you love like this do something to one of your family members? It's, it's just despicable that something happened that, that these people who meant so much to so many people were taken away for something so insignificant. 